Hey everybody, Milton Davis here. Um, hope you guys are enjoying your weekend. And today I'm here with another episode of What Was I Thinking? Um, today I want to talk about a comic book series that we started uh, a few years ago called um, Angolo Diaspora. It's a African martial arts um, series based on our script, Angolo, written by yours truly and Balagoon Ojitade. Um, before I get into the book, I kind of want to go back a little bit and give you some background of my experiences with martial arts. Um, I had a very um, interesting role on the martial arts journey, which actually began when I was in the fifth grade. Um, it was around that time where um, I started to realize that a lot of my uh, peers were starting to get a lot larger than me. <laughs> and that, and because of the fact that I had kind of a quick temper, I needed to do something to learn how to protect myself. And that's when my uh, parents allowed me to take self-defense classes at the uh, uh, YMCA in Columbus, Georgia, uh, AJ McClung YMCA. And I turned, you know, you they taught you the little stuff like hip throws and all that kind of stuff like that. So during that summer, I became the master of the hip throw. There was nobody who could come at me that I could not find some kind of way to get you on a hip throw. That was my thing for a long time. So that kind of went on for a little bit. And when I um, got into high school, um, I fell in with a group of friends who um, we all hung out and hung out together, you know, and played around together. And um, we had a, a friend of ours named Carl. And Carl actually knew the martial arts. And Carl was a very, very good martial artist. So this was also during the time when kung fu movies and karate movies were all big and stuff like that. So um, Carl decided that he would teach all of us martial arts. And I became one of his uh, heart ardent students. You know, I would work out every day. We didn't have a formal classroom. Um, we didn't have uniforms or anything like that. We actually used to meet in this open area because in the woods, not, not too far from where we lived because we had a lot of wood, wooded lots and stuff like that. So we used to meet there and Carl would basically teach us. Um, you know, he taught us the basics of, you know, the martial arts, you know, sidekicks, all this kind of stuff like that, punching and stuff like that. But one of the things about the way we learned was that we learned from other people. Um, Carl was very good at bringing people from various styles of martial arts to work out with us. Um, I remember one time actually working out with a guy who knew what um, we call a prison style, alto rap, and um, I sparred with him for a little while. Uh, we had um, one of our friends, uh, Bobby Jeromello, who was like learning on the streets like we did, but he was also taking classes in a, in a, in a Taekwondo class. So we learned stuff from him. And um, so it was, um, and, and, it, and I also actually used to incorporate stuff from reading the books. You know, some of you guys that may remember some of back in the day, I used to read the Masayama books. Um, I had the Dao Jeet Kune Do by uh, Bruce Lee. And so I would look at these techniques and stuff like that. And then I would work out and practice and try to work, you know, try to make sure I got the techniques right and different things like that. And, um, but you got to realize too, when we were doing the martial arts back in the day, um, we went to a high school that was uh, rather notorious for having riots, unfor unfortunately. And so part of what we were doing was we were learning how to really protect ourselves. So the stuff that we learned was actually practical stuff. We weren't learning how to tournament fight or anything like that. We were learn learning what you needed to do if you got into a fight on the streets. And we started this thing like once a week, we would have what we called a free for all, where all of us would get together and we just basically had this big sparring match, everybody against everybody. And um, it got to be popular to where one day when we went to do it, there were a bunch of people waiting to see us come in because we did it in this playground in this neighborhood. And there was a bunch of people lined along the fence to watch us do our big free for all. And some uh, some of the local martial artists used to come by and visit us as well and, and join in. And whenever somebody new came, we would always kind of um, um, eliminate, eliminate ourselves so we could watch that person fight Carl because Carl was just that good. He was really that good. Um, so um, after high school, um, you know, we graduated, um, Carl and uh, some of the other friends that we worked out with, with, they went their separate ways. So I'm stuck here and I really didn't have anybody to work out with. So that's when I started what I call my journey, journeyman um, time where I would go out to Fort Benning and work out with some of the soldiers there, which was really great because a lot of these soldiers had learned different styles from throughout the world. You know, people had, had keto, different types of styles and stuff like that. So I got a chance to work out with them. I ended up with a, a gentleman by, we called him uh, Sergeant McCall, Sensei McCall, who um, was a, a practice practitioner of Chinese Kenpo. And so I started working, working out with him for a long time as well. So I picked up some techniques from there. And then I forgot to add that my father was also a boxer when he was in the Marines. 
And one day he came outside and I'm working out on my heavy bag that was hanging off our clothesline. And he's like, boy, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, dad, I'm doing karate, that kind of stuff. So uh, he came to the bag and he started, you know, boxing, punching and started showing me some boxing techniques. So I kind of picked up different styles, things that I liked. I picked up the boxing style from my dad. You know, I picked up my kicks and stuff from uh, from uh, Taekwondo and from uh, Thai boxing. So I ended up with like a... Um, I guess it's called an, an amalgamated style that I used to work work out with. And d despite the fact that I never went to a school, uh, whenever I would go to work out with schools, you know, the instructor would always say, okay, let me see what you got and stuff. And I'd do my little thing. And, and he'd always have me working out with um, black belts and brown belts and stuff like that. Because, you know, I had practical martial arts, um, um, practical martial arts experience in working out on the street. And I forgot to add one thing. Um, back in the day, I had a pretty good amount of flexibility, and I have to, um, I owe that to a girlfriend that I had in my freshman year in high school who was a cheerleader, who taught me the stretching exercises that the uh, cheerleaders would do in order for flexibility, and I got to the point where I could actually do like the splits, the Chinese splits and stuff like that, so that made me really flexible when it came to karate. So, that's where my martial arts background came from. So, what in the world was I thinking when I created Ingolo Diaspora? So when I was sitting down, when I first decided to start writing, and I was sitting down trying to decide what um, what I was going to write, uh, one of the things that came to my mind was, you know, you know, you always see martial arts movies, um, and you have had martial arts movie with black martial artists as the lead, but I've never seen a martial arts movie that was based on African martial arts. Now at the time, I had never been exposed to, martial, to African martial arts, but I knew there had to be some. Every country, every culture that has warriors and fighters has a martial arts. It's just, that's just common sense, you know, human thing. But I, I never had been exposed to it. And when I did my research, the only thing I could really find was capoeira. So when I initially thought about this idea, I was thinking about capoeira. But as some of you already know, when I started doing my research on African martial arts, that's how I met Balogun Ojitade. And he's an African martial artist. So, you know, I, I, he just expanded my whole, um, my whole world when it came to African martial arts. And I started learning about martial arts from different African countries and cultures and stuff. So um, when I was thinking about doing, um, writing something, I said, I want to write an African martial arts story. For some odd reason, this story came to me in a script. I think it may be because I was thinking about movies at the time. So the original name of the script was Ingolo. And I said, well, I just don't want this to be one of those martial arts things where the guys just find stupid reasons to get into a fight and all that kind of stuff like that. I wanted there to be a plot behind it. So I came up with this idea about this world where um, assassinations were legal and the assassinations were carried out by sanctioned groups called guilds. And each guild had a specialty that they, uh, a specialty martial arts that they came, that they used. Because one of the rules of the guilds is that they, could, they couldn't use firearms and different things like that. Assassin, assassinations had to, had to take place by hand. And just like somebody would hire a guild to assassinate a person, a person would hire another guild to protect them. And so that's why you had the different guilds sometimes fighting against each other and competing against, against each other. But in this particular world, the most, um, the most experienced and most deadly guild of all was the Blood Men Guild. And the Blood Men Guild was a guild that was based on African martial arts. In the case when I was writing the story, Capoeira. So, um, I'm working on this script and I'm writing it down and I did not have a lot of experience in writing scripts. So at some point I just got tired of it. I said, you know what, I don't, I don't, like, I don't even want to write this script anymore. I'm going to set it aside. So years later, after I met Balogun and we were talking about projects and stuff, I told him about Angolo. And he's like, man, you know, that's interesting. You know, so I told him about the story and stuff. And then he said, well, how do you see this ending? I said, well, then I told him how I felt like the story was going to end. And, you know, Balagoon at the time, I didn't know, was also a, a talented screenplay script writer. So he said, well, send it to me, man. You know, I'll, I'll, uh, you know, I'll finish it up for you. I said, okay, cool. So I sent the script to him, and about two weeks later, he came back. Here you go. I'm like, man, that was quick. So I looked at the script, and it was really good. I mean, he actually made, he made some changes in it that made the script stronger, you know, with the relationships and stuff. So we had this really good African martial arts script and had no idea what we were going to do with it. So we let it sit for a long time. So um, about a few years later, we heard about the Urban Action Showcase. And this is basically a, um, uh, an organization or an event that was created by HBO to encourage you know, 
black people to create action films and martial arts films. And they just so happened to have a screenplay contest. So we said, hey man, let's send the screenplay into this thing and see what happens. So we sent it in and um, I'm sitting there saying, well, you know, we're going to be competing against all these people. You know, it's probably not going to do well, you know, both of us. You know, I, I've never written a script before. And so Balagun said, you know what, man, I think we're going to win this. So I'm going to go to New York to this event. And I said, okay, cool. You know, so he went to the event. I'm sitting at home. I'm talking to my wife. And I'm like, you know, you know, this, this, I'm telling her all the reasons why we weren't going to win this competition, you know. And as I was talking to her, the phone rings. And it's Balagoon. And I said, hey, what's up? He said, hey, man, guess what? I said, what? He said, we won. I'm like, really? <laughs> he said, yeah, we won. So we actually ended up winning the 2014 Urban Action Showcase competition for best screenplay. So we had this award winning screenplay. And we said, okay, what are we going to do with this? And we didn't think about it. So we just said, we just set it aside. Um, a few more years later, um, my next door neighbor who moved in um, actually was a um, Hollywood camera cameraman he worked on a lot of the big movies like fast and furious he worked on black panther all those kind of things like that and him and i was in a conversation and he mentioned that he knew um ludicrous and i said hey man we got this script that we just that we wrote and if it's not asking too much can you show it to him he said yeah i'll show it to chris you know he calls him chris and stuff so gave him the script he showed it to him he said well you know he thought it was good but he was passed on it and you know that's how things usually go when you're dealing with folks in that situation anyway. I thought he would be interested in it because I know he, he was a, he's a practitioner of 52 blocks and different things like that. And we incorporate that into the story. So again, we got the script and it's just sitting there. So uh, a few more years later, and we decided to start getting into comic books. And so we said, hey, you know, we got this script. Let's develop this into a comic book series. And we got in contact with Peter Daniels. Uh, Peter Daniels, um, has a uh, comic book company out of Nigeria, Peta Studios and Peta Comics. And we always wanted to do something where we'd be working with someone from the continent. So we talked to Peter and said, hey, man, we got this script. We want to develop it into a comic book series. Um, and we'd love you to do the artwork. And Peter said, cool. So Peter got some artists together. You know, we gave him the script. Um, we did a Kickstarter a few years ago. We raised the money for the Kickstarter. And that's how N'Golo Diaspora came to be. Um, that's how the comic book came to be. And so, you know, we also, once we did the comic book and we started looking at the perks and, and uh, what we would be giving, a, giving away for people to who pledged, we also thought about doing a, making the book an, into a novella. And that's where the N'Golo Diaspora novella came from, which is amazing cover art by Jason Reeves. So that's in a nutshell <laughs> how, how we came up with the idea for Angola Diaspora. We are now in the process of getting ready to work on Angola Diaspora 2. We did not tell the entire story in the first comic book. It was no way we could do that. Um, we're probably going to end up with a series of about five, maybe six comic books in all, where we will actually tell the ent entire story as a comic book series. Now, one of the good things about doing that is that these days, a lot of movies that you see are developed from comic books because basically a comic book works as a storyboard for people who are developing the film. It's something for the director to look at and all and see follow the sequences and stuff like that. So that was a um, kind of another ulterior motive for us doing the Ingolo Diaspora into a comic book series. Um, will we pitch it as a series again? Um, will we try to make it as an independent film ourselves? Um, we don't know. We're not sure. But, um, you know, it's a great book. Uh, we've had fun doing it. Um, we've, got some, we've got some great artwork in it. Um, getting a chance to be able to tell a story like this um, in a way that we feel has never been told before has been fun as well. So um, that's it, guys. Um, that's what I was thinking when I developed Angolo Diaspora. Um, be on the lookout for the Kickstarter for in July for um, issue two. And uh, we hope you guys support it, and I hope you're looking forward to the next issue for those of you who've already seen it. Take care. Peace.